Hello, we're here with Port Commissioner Ryan Calkins, who is running for re-election for position one at Seattle Port. Would you like to go ahead with your two-minute introduction? Sure. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Calkins. I Four years ago, I ran for Port Commission, kind of out of the blue, as uh, somebody who had been tangentially connected to some of what the port did, but was really motivated by a desire to expand the environmental agenda of the Port of Seattle. And uh, in some ways, much to my surprise, I managed to beat an incumbent and uh, sort of be the dog that catched, caught the car and had an opportunity to, to put some values into action at the port. And the last four years have been a pretty momentous occasion for us at the Port of Seattle. Not only were the first three years really a period of, um, at the tail end of a, a really long period of boom for our economy, but one that was not shared across the region equally. Uh, in many places in King County, particularly the areas where the port had the greatest impact, the that shared prosperity didn't reach those communities. And so um, I had an opportunity to see firsthand ways in which we could begin to address um, an equitable equ economic recovery after the pandemic. In addition, I came in very much an environmentalist, uh, and I think over the last four years, I would change that title to now someone who seeks environmental justice, knowing that uh, the perspectives of the people around the table matter a great deal. Uh, I've spent uh, a lot of my time as commissioner just sitting and listening with folks in the Duwamish Valley and in the airport fence line communities to find out not only the goal, but also how do we achieve, what are the means that we use to get to an, to an environmental end so that they are participatory, they involve people in the community. And now as we look forward, I, I think we have an opportunity at the Port of Seattle to, to take that environmental justice and equitable economic recovery to the next level. And so I'm really excited to have an opportunity to run for this office again. I really love the job and I hope that I'll get the support of the 36th District Democrats to do so. Great, thank you so much. And now we'll move into our four prepared questions. Um, I will place the first one into the chat so that you can follow along as, uh, let's see, uh, we have Caitlin going first. Would you like to ask this one, Caitlin? Of course, yes, I'd love to start with that. Um, so question one, COVID has increased existing inequalities as a port commissioner, how would you support the most vulnerable? How would you promote an equitable recovery and create opportunity for all through the port? This is um, this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. In fact, um, last month I published an op-ed in the Seattle Times about what I believe is the pathway to an equitable recovery. And effectively what you do is you center those who have been hardest impacted uh, or who have been furthest from economic justice. And in our communities, those are uh, people of color, uh, women, uh, small business owners who, uh, particularly BIPOC and women-owned businesses, who were greatly impacted by it, not only in terms of their business enterprises, but also in terms of workforce. And so if we put those folks at the center and design policies and programs around those folks in conversation with them, you know, starting with, the, with dialogue, saying, what is it that you need for recovery? then the recovery that's centered on those folks will then spill over into other areas of the economy. And I, I genuinely believe that that type of centering of the, the folks who are most impacted is the certainly the most efficient and effective way to recover. And as a public agency, that's essentially our role. The market may not do that on its own. And so it's, it's the role of a public agency to come in and say, how do we ensure that economic recovery targets those folks who have been furthest from economic justice. So I think that's, you know, at a, at a kind of values level, uh, how I would describe it. What that means concretely is that um, we thankfully have, uh, we established two years ago, our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And uh, Bukta Gesar, who is our senior director, one of the first things she did was put together an equity toolkit for us that helps us to identify. We needed the data. Where are these folks who are most impacted? And, um, 
it was the most prescient thing we could have done in anticipation of a pandemic, not knowing what was coming, but having that data, which has then guided our recovery efforts, including the Opportunity Youth Initiative, our South King County Fund, which has been directed towards those folks. And as we're writing our budget for 2022, using that same data around impact to, to determine how we are gonna help in an equitable economic recovery. Great, thank you. Um, now we're gonna move into question two, but I wanted to let, uh, so Mary Kylie, question two is for you. And then on deck after that is uh, Alice and then Jeff. So let me go ahead and post that. Here we go. Okay. Um, how have you worked to combat climate change and promote climate justice? How would you ensure that the port drastically lowers net carbon carbon emissions by 2030 and achieves carbon neutrality by 2050? This is my favorite question. <laughs> um, this is why I, I ran for port because I, I felt like we needed to, to accelerate the timeline to address climate change at the Port of Seattle. So concretely, a few things we've done, uh, we established really audacious goals early on in my term. Uh, one of them was the, the establishment of a, a goal of 10% sustainable aviation fuels at SeaTac Airport, uh, which may not sound like a lot, but when you recognize that that's, that would be about 75 million gallons of, of SAF per year uh, at SeaTac alone, and the current global production of SAF is about 5 million gallons, it means that we're going to have to work really, really hard to get there. But if we can do it, it's not just about what we would do for local air pollution, but also GHG emissions globally. And if we can show how an airport can do it, then that's a model that airports around the world of our size or bigger can use, and that's where we can really have impact. And so what that meant in terms of steps to get there was we identified early on in 2018, after I was elected to the commission, that we needed to press for a low carbon fuel standard at the state. And if you're following the news, you'll see that this last Sunday, we, uh, the state legislature successfully passed a low carbon fuel standard, which now goes to the governor's desk. And in a lot of ways, I feel like they've kind of called our bluff. We said, we need this to be able to do this. Now they've given it to us. We've got the tool in hand. And this week, the first thing we did Tuesday morning was held a, a study session on SAF to say, what are the next steps? And uh, I could spend an hour on this topic. It's two minutes, but we have a similar project on the waterfront where we're seeking to bring biofuels and, and electrify the waterfront so that we have we reduce to zero the amount of local air pollution coming from the Port of Seattle operations. Great, thank you. Question three, um, let's see here. That was Alice. Uh, this is a long one. Um, the port has operations and activities on tribal and indigenous land. How would you use your position to elevate indigenous people and encourage more equity and opportunity for black indigenous and people of color communities? Give us some specific examples of your plans in this aspect. And then this is sort of a secondary question. How would you handle your approach to women and POC owned businesses? So the, the relationship with the, the tribes of the Port of Seattle uh, started out very bad uh, in, in our history and has slowly improved, but we're not there yet. We have a lot of work to do. And um, we've, we've made some important gestures uh, to the tribal communities in our area and where we have operations. And there's an opportunity, I think, for some pretty significant steps moving forward. Right now, we're in the middle of negotiations over fishing rights with a couple of the tribes in the area that have fishing rights in, in Elliott Bay, uh, where we have ships traversing. And it has taught me a great deal about when you are working with a sovereign nation, what the expectations are with a group across the table. And uh, for the Port of Seattle, at, particularly with maritime operations, uh, this is an area where we can, again, be a model agency for others to follow. So the first thing we do is as most do is to acknowledge that this is unceded ancestral lands of these tribes. And uh, so we're guests essentially. And so we ought to think about it that way. Uh, I think the, the biggest historical damage we did was to the Duwamish River. And we're currently involved in a number of cleanup efforts that from you know, the, the shorelines, the water itself, and also the, the sediment along the beds. Uh, 
uh, and we will continue to do that work and expand it. Um, one project in particular, which I think is exemplary, is the T117 project, uh, where we are restoring um, Esteran lands uh, to their original condition, and we're making sure that it's accessible public shoreline so that the communities in, this, in South Park are able to access that waterway as well. Great, thank you. And the final of the prepared questions, uh, Jeff. Sure, so what is the port's responsibility when it comes to protecting and lifting up workers? What do you think are some opportunities for improving the port's relationship with organized labor and those workers who do not currently have access to the protection of a union, such as Uber and Lyft drivers? Uh, the role of the port uh, so we have 2,000 of our own employees, um, over half of whom are represented employees. And so first off, we need to be honorable in our negotiations with, our, with the unions with whom we negotiate. That's first and foremost. Second is uh, we need to be pushing for, even for our non-represented employees, for labor standards and policies that are exemplary for a public agency, for a private enterprise. Uh, and I personally, as a former small business owner, that is something that it was just a part of the, the philosophy. It really felt like if you treat your employees well, then you're going to have a family of employees that your attrition will be lower. I mean, you could make a business case for why that's true. But now in a much larger agency and one that has um, quite a bit of ability to, to dictate um, not just the conditions for our workers, but the workers who also occupy our facilities through tenants or other forms. And, and one concrete example of that is the uh, Prop 1 minimum wage bill that um, SeaTac pioneered back before, reported, uh, before the city of Seattle did, um, had a carve out through negotiation for a certain subsector of uh, of workers, which were the flight kitchen workers in the city of SeaTac. And so they did not get covered by that Prop 1, which meant that up until today, they're still paid in the 11 and 12, $13 range when they start, instead of the now it's north of $16 in the city of SeaTac. And so after working with the labor union, with uh, HERE, we put together a bill, took it to the state legislature, got it passed, brought it back so that we could apply that, fix basically that carve out so that those workers would be included too. And it's a couple thousand workers um, that we needed a technical fix this year because of the pandemic, uh, there was some language that, that upended our intention from the last bill, but we got that fixed thanks to Senator Kaiser. And uh, now we're just waiting on the 90 day period after the governor's signature, and then that will go into effect. So it's little actions like that too, that can have a huge impact for those families that rely on, you know, they've got a 40 hour a week job, but at $12 an hour, that's not enough to, to cover a living wage. Great, thank you. And now I'll open it up to questions from the board and the responses to these are going to be one minute a piece. Looking for hands. <laughs> Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, so a few years ago, there was, a, and forgive me if I'm not using the right term, but a unification or cooperation between the Port of Tacoma and, and the Port of Seattle. I'm just wondering, how is that going? Is it as, as awesome as we thought it was going to be? Was it worth doing? Um, can you give any kind of update on that? Yeah, so the Northwest Seaport Alliance is the operating alliance between the Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma for international cargo at the two facilities. And it has, it has been uh, a very successful venture, uh, in part uh, because we, it's prevented us from a race to the bottom against each other. So we're no longer competing against each other. We're offering the full suite of services that the two ports can offer to the major carriers. And this comes in a, in a universe of consolidation right now in the global shipping and logistics industries where, you know, at the turn of the century, there were 50 shipping companies, 50 major shipping companies around the globe. These are, you know, approximately, um, now there are very few. There, there's down to three alliances that basically control most of global trade. And so it's hard to negotiate against them if you're a little guy. Together, we're much more capable of negotiating strong agreements. And it's also meant that we can reinvest both 
in two premier terminals in Tacoma and two in Seattle. And we're finishing that off in the next two years at Terminal 5. So there, there's some hiccups for sure, Jeff, but uh, I think by and large, it's going really well. And I would attribute the hiccups to the fact that we King County commissioners are quite progressive and we're trying to bring our Tacoma commissioners along with us on some things, but we'll get them there. Thank you. Great, uh, Alice. Yeah, what do you think the port's role is in helping um, create and foster and support um, uh, walkable, bikeable, livable communities? Um, I think a lot of times people think of like freight and the port as being kind of um, antagonistic to um, these sort of like safer communities for folks who aren't in cars at the time. Um, and I'm just curious what your take is on that. Oh, I think one area where the Venn diagram of port interests and the interests of, I would say, um, the walkable, livable communities is that we all want to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips. It's something, you know, when I'm wearing my port commission hat, I am advocating for that really hard. When I'm not wearing that hat, when I'm wearing my uh, resident of the city of Seattle hat, um, I will advocate for more bike lanes and fewer cars and, and, uh, and, you know, so it <laughs> depends on which Ryan you're talking to, but I would say at the Port of Seattle, we share the desire to reduce the number of single oc occupancy vehicle trips and the infrastructure needed to support that. That isn't to say we, we don't want any highways or bridges. We, we do. We want to be able to move goods efficiently through our region, but we just don't want to have to fight, you know, every person sitting in there that's doing their single person commute. Uh, and it would be better for all of us if that were the case. So I think that's one of the areas where there's overlap. The other is I think there's ample opportunity for the port to be a, particularly on the waterfront, to, to be a good neighbor to everyone else who wants to use the waterfront. And in a lot of ways, we're able as a public agency to, to bring into perpetual public ownership a lot of spaces. So when you think of Centennial Park, Myrtle Edwards Centennial Park that runs along the Elliott, north end of Elliott Bay, you know, that's a collaboration between the city of Seattle and the Port of Seattle and some private partners to have a beautiful waterfront space that will be forever in public hands. Great, thank you. Any other follow-up questions? I have one. Um, so out of all the things that you've done so far at the port, what would you say uh, you're most proud of? Uh, Maritime High School. Um, we, uh, I'm, I get kind of choked up just thinking about it. I can't believe the amazing people who've come around this project and, and made it happen. It was an idea that just stated uh, two and a half years ago, uh, summer of 2018, we began to talk about it. Um, and uh, now in September, we're going to have 45 kids starting their first year at Maritime High School. And then it's going to grow to 420 kids or so in four years. And um, just this week, we heard that Adam Smith is going to include it in his community projects to help us get funding for it. We have $10 million in outstanding asks right now from philanthropists and industry and others. And so we're starting to build our, our capital budget to be able to build a a facility on the waterfront so that yes. kids are not only going to have access to an amazing school, but get out on a vessel. Oh, I could go on and on, but I, I'm, I'm floored by the support that has come around the idea and, and brought it to fruition. Thank you. Any other follow-ups? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, uh, I know that the airport is pretty quiet the last year compared to previous years, but in the long term, over decades, uh, there'll be a lot of demand. And I'm wondering what capacity is there or what chance is there to expand capacity? There's not a lot of geography to add a runway. So what long term, what's the port thinking about that? Uh, the port is going to follow the mandate of both the federal government and the state government, which is to maximize capacity utilization at, at SeaTac Airport. And uh, we're following the guidelines of a 2009 state study, which says before any other airport is cited, we really need to make sure that we get as much flow through SeaTac as possible. That said, um, we're never building a fourth runway. Um, you heard it here first. We're not building fourth runway. There's just the it's it's technically infeasible and it's also too much of a burden on communities around the airport. I my long term hopes for um, 
aviation writ large in Western Washington is that uh, we won't need an, a significant second major airport, but instead that other forms of technology, including, and, and I was a little bit more bullish on high-speed rail than I am now. I, I would say there's some limitations there, not, not to high-speed rail itself, but that other technologies are, I think are gonna come in and potentially displace it in terms of cost and convenience and, uh, and fluidity, uh, flexibility. So, um, you know, we have a really exciting startup sector in electric aviation, which will not only um, change the calculus about how, how we fly. So right now, the bigger the plane, the better in terms of cost per passenger mile. But in electric aviation, you can kind of flip that on its head. It's okay to put six or eight or 10 people in an electric plane, and you'll get about the same cost compared to a larger plane. And so, you know, imagine a flight right now that comes in from Spokane, so then that person can go to um, San Francisco or Oregon. Uh, and is using horizon flights to kind of um, jettison through there. Ideally, they would just be able to take that uh, one hop flight from Spokane directly to Bend and electric aviation is gonna make that economically feasible. And so it's gonna reduce some of the demand for a hub airport like SeaTac. And I think that's a good thing over the long term, particularly as our population expands. Thank you. It's a fascinating riddle, Jeff, and I, it's gonna be a really fun one to solve. I hope I get another four years to keep working on it. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, Barbara, but we're actually out of time for any further questions, but uh, if you would like, you can, may go ahead and give a one minute wrap up. Sure, thank you all so much for taking the time to do these interviews. I know that you're all volunteers and it is a long, process and a, a lot of volunteer hours just sitting on Zoom calls when you could be, I don't know, binge watching something on Netflix instead of <laughs> hanging out with me. Um, and so I'm, I'm really appreciative of it. It is, you know, our LD structure for the Democratic Party is the beating heart of our successes in the region. And I, and as I think to the, the legislative session, how important it was that we had strong uh, grassroots uh, voices going to to Olympia and the 36th was present there for sure in a lot of ways. So I just uh, uh, thank you for that. And also I just wanna um, appreciate that the 36th was one of my first endorsements four years ago. You guys took uh, a gamble on a nobody and I, I hope that I've lived up to expectations. I love this job. I hope I get to do it for four more years. And so I'd really love to have the support of the 36th as I seek reelection. Great, thank you so much.